overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wives, of rich food filled with marrow, and of well-aged uh, wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Received. 
that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of which are still alive, but some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim and so you have come to believe. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. He said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. There are some things that's just great about being an Episcopalian. <laughs> Every time you say it, you know what the response is going to be. And you know, after a long season of Lent with its muted colors and its minor chords, after bearing witness again during Holy Week to our Lord's betrayal, to his arrest, and to his crucifixion, Easter's celebratory trumpet blast and its blossoming flowers bursting all around feels not only like something of a relief, but maybe even something like joyful defiance. And so when we hear that triumphant Easter proclamation, the response rises up in us almost automatically, if not emphatically. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. But what if instead of that customary response, we didn't say anything at all? What if we just stayed silent? I tell you what, let's try it out. Let's see how it feels. All right, I'm going to say those words again, and you're not going to say anything in response. Alleluia! Christ is risen! Who liked that? <laughs> it feels strange, doesn't it? It's like a dangling participle or an incomplete sentence. Joy bottled up inside your soul, bouncing around. Something inside you compels that typical response, even if you just have to mutter it under your breath. How many of you actually muttered it under your breath anyway? <laughs> <laughs> we can't help it. Christ has defeated death. Christ has defeated the power of sin. Love triumphs over hate. Life is victorious over death. The gates of hell have been destroyed, and mercy has bathed all of creation. It is an earth-shaking, life-transforming truth, and it wants to be told. It wants to be shouted. It needs to be heard in our world. And that is exactly what makes the Gospel of Mark so very, very strange. Go tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. The mysterious strangers tells the women in today's Gospel. There you will see Jesus just as he told you. 
So they went out and they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Alleluia, Christ is risen and they said nothing to anyone. It is such an extraordinarily jarring ending to the gospel story and it's not what we're accustomed to hearing on this day. Usually at Easter, we focus on the stories that tie up all the loose ends of Jesus' life on earth. In John's gospel, we get the grieving Mary Magdalene unexpectedly stumbling upon Jesus in the garden early on Easter day. Later, Jesus dispels Thomas' doubts by showing him the crucifixion wounds in his hands and side. And still later, Jesus cooks all of his friends' breakfast on the beach. In Luke's gospel, the disciples encounter Jesus on the road to Emmaus, and they break bread with him. In Matthew's gospel, the disciples rendezvous with their Lord in Galilee, tidily coming full circle to where it all began. Each of the gospels goes out of its way to erase any doubt of Jesus' bodily resurrection. We touch his wounds. We, We break bread and eat with him. We walk together with him in the flesh. There is a certain and everyone lived happily ever after quality to the stories of the Gospels, except in the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, we don't get any of those reassuring resurrection stories intended to calm our hearts after the chaos of the crucifixion. There is no encounter with the resurrected Christ in our gospel today. Just an empty tomb in silence. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Silence is particularly unsettling in Mark's gospel because throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus had repeatedly sworn his disciples to secrecy about his true identity until after his resurrection. Don't tell people who I really am, he says over and over again after he heals someone or does some miracle that amazes. Don't tell anyone until I've risen from the dead. Throughout the gospel, it's like a drumbeat, a staccato note played over and over and over again. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Not until I've risen from the grave. Many scholars chalk it up to Jesus not wanting to draw too much political attention to himself in the early days of his ministry, to fly under the radar until just the right moment. I mean, that might be true, but, but Jesus doesn't exactly keep a low profile in Mark's gospel. By the end of the first chapter, we're told that Jesus' fame has already spread throughout the region. Maybe we can attribute it to a kind of dramatic irony in which the reader knows something that the characters in the story don't. Yet even that has problems, because it's clear the disciples actually know who Jesus is. Remember when Peter declares Jesus to be the Messiah? And Jesus immediately sternly orders him not to tell anyone. And then again in the transfiguration when the glory of Jesus is revealed, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Both the readers and the characters know exactly what's happening in the story. They know how it's going to end, yet no one is allowed to speak it, to declare it, to proclaim it. And it's particularly peculiar in Mark's gospel since the gospel literally begins with the proclamation and the revelation of who Jesus really is. The first verse in Mark says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so in the face of a mystery, scholars have come up with a special term for this aspect of Mark. It's called the messianic secret. But let's be clear, it's something of a misnomer because there's nothing secret about it. It's right there in the first line of the story. The reader knows it, 
The disciples know it, and in Mark's gospel, even the demons know it. I want to suggest this morning it's more like the messianic embargo. When I was working as a newspaper journalist, organizations and PR firms would regularly release news to us, but they would embargo its release until a certain date. It was a way to give us a heads up about something big coming down the pike, to build excitement and energy around an announcement. It, it gave us a chance to prepare a story so that on the day the embargo is lifted, the airwaves in the newspapers are flooded with your story. It's a great marketing tactic. I think something like that might be going on in Mark's gospel. Christ embargoes this crazy, incredible, life-changing good news of God until after he rises from the dead. And so by the end of the gospel, his messianic embargo has built this brilliant tension in the story. It just throngs with it. The universe's best news is on the cusp of being let out. You can almost feel the truth gnawing at the ropes holding it back. It's a truth that wants to be told. By the closing chapters of Mark's gospel, as, as Christ stands before Pilate in his trial, Pilate, who holds his fate in his hand, our Lord holds the line on that divine embargo in front of the one person who could change the outcome. Jesus refuses to answer Pilate, and, and we are all but shouting in our hearts, tell him, tell him the truth. Break the silence. Release the good news. So we hold on and we white-knuckle it through the cross and the crucifixion and the brutality of his death until we can finally see the good news proclaimed because we know that when he rises, that's when it's going to get out, that secret. The identity of Jesus will be fully and dramatically revealed. We're awaiting that moment when the embargo drops and the open secret is finally proclaimed. But then, then after all the waiting, the tomb is empty. Alleluia, Christ is risen and the disciples said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And the gospel ends as abruptly as that. Wasn't this the moment? Wasn't this the moment that the messianic secret was supposed to be shouted from the rooftops? The moment the embargo dropped and the truth was going to flood the world. The entire gospel builds to this moment, but it ends with the disciples keeping the secret rather than telling it. How brilliant is that? If I had to choose a retelling of the gospel, this is the one. Of course, someone told eventually. We have the story. But Mark chooses to end his gospel story here so that Mark can drop the resurrection into the lap of every single reader who hears his message for the next 2,000 years. He puts the messianic secret into each of our hands. In the deafening silence of the final words of Mark's gospel, it is suddenly all up to us, the reader, to respond. It's probably why, I suppose, we have so many different additions to the end of Mark's gospel. Over the years, folks have penned more satisfying conclusions. Their later editions, the earliest manuscripts of Mark's, ends with silence. But we couldn't leave what was unsettled, so we tried to settle it. Because otherwise, if it's left unsettled, we become the bearers of the messianic secret that aches to be told every time we read Mark's gospel. Because otherwise, the story isn't over. Because otherwise, Mark's gospel really is, as it says in the first verse, only the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's only the beginning. It's not the whole story. Not even close. Mark ends his gospel in verse 8. 
so that we can become verse 9. We are that most important yet unwritten verse in the gospel. We are what comes next. We are the ongoing story of the gospel in the world. Indeed, the most important verse in the gospel of Mark is the one the writer intentionally never wrote. The most important verse is the one that you and I write when we leave this place and we go out into a world that is desperate and hungry for grace, that is desperate and hungry for mercy, that is desperate and hungry for love. In Mark's gospel, you matter. You matter to God. You matter to God's story. The story ends without you. You are the next verse. You are the next chapter. You are the next story. You are where God's grace unfolds in the world. Mark ends his gospel in this way so that we will know without a shadow of a doubt that we've been entrusted with the world-changing good news and that for the story to go on in this world, it must go on in our lives. That it's up to us to break the disciples' silence. I don't think that means we go down to Main Street and during Easter brunch, we start shouting Bible verses at people. (laughs) No, we proclaim the gospel not just with our lips, but with our lives. We proclaim with our lives that love is stronger than hate. That life is victorious over death. That mercy triumphs over judgment. We get to break the silence and proclaim the good news that God loves you so much more than you could ever imagine. So much that God would rather die than condemn you. So much so that God in Christ would break down the gates of hell to retrieve that one lost sheep to proclaim the good news with our lives that by his death, Christ has destroyed death. And by his rising, he has won for us everlasting life. My friends, that is good news indeed. It's good news we need and it's good news the world needs. And it's up to us to tell the story. It's up to us to break the silence. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The The Lord Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. 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 invite you to stand and turning to page five, let us affirm our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God the Father, God from God, light from light, True God, true God, begotten of one being, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. 
We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge the baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found in page 387 of the Red Book of Common Prayer and also on page 6 of your bulletins. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. <coughs> May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they possess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the peace of the risen Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us share God's peace. I know it's often not easy to walk into a new space with different things going on, and, and if this is your first time in a long time in an Episcopal church, or even your first time in an Episcopal church, congratulations, you, are, you have more courage than most um, <laughs> to come on, on Easter Day and have to juggle all the things. So, but we're so glad that you're here, and we would love to get to know you. There's a, a card in the pew back um, that is for you to write your name and your contact information. Um, we really do want to get to know you. And we want you to get to know us and what God is doing here and how you can be a part of that. Because we really do believe that you belong in the house of God in some way. And there's a place for you here at St. James. Um, so as the offering plate comes by, just drop that in. That is your best offering you can give us today. Um, that would be a, a tremendous gift for us. Um, our offering today, uh, as we do every Easter, uh, we, we, we share a tithe of the Easter offering with one of our outreach partners. So today, um, as you give for a, an Easter offering, 10% of that will go to our partners in the Episcopal Diocese in Jerusalem. Uh, given the, the, the violence and the war in the Holy Land, uh, our brothers and sisters in the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem are continuing to proclaim the resurrection in the midst of, uh, of war and in the midst of death. So it's good and it's holy and it's difficult, but it's important work. And this is one way we can continue to share in the resurrection. So please let us know if, if, you're, if you are giving for our Easter offering just by notating that on your check or on the envelope. Um, 
<laughs> we have had a tremendous week here at St. James, and um, I, I want to say thank you to everybody um, who helped to make it happen. Um, you, you, you see a handful of us up here, but it's, it's like that old metaphor of the duck that you see swimming and like all the legs of all the church underneath going 90 to nothing, paddling us through Holy Week. So it takes so many folks uh, to make this week happen, um, from the altar guild who sets the table, to the flower guild who beautifies this area, to our readers, to our acolytes, to our servers, to our bell tower ringers, to our hospitality guild, to our incredible choir who work incredibly hard. Our AV ministry, uh, this is the danger of doing this, you always accidentally forget someone, so uh, every year I update my thank yous with who I forgot, but I want you to know that if I, I haven't mentioned you or, or your team that's helped, I am thankful because every small thing that happens and every large thing that happens makes this service possible, even if it's just holding the door open for somebody coming in. Uh, so thank you. And I want to say a special thank you to our incredible staff for all that they've done this week, for Brad G, our director of music, for Perry, our sexton, who you may not see, but gets everything in, a, in the right place in, in some kind of magical, mysterious quality. Um, our new court curate, Corey, um, our director of communications, Mindy. So if you like the bulletins, um, if they were helpful for you, send her an email. That will mean the world to her. We, we had to lay hands on our printer a couple of times. Um, <laughs> we had to bless it. We'll, we'll call it bless it. Um, um, who am I missing? Am I missing? And De Tim, our deacon, who has been a, a huge gift, as always, with his preaching throughout Holy Week. Um, it is a blessing to be here and to worship with you, and I'm so, so grateful uh, to be a part of this faith community and the witness it has in, in the Hendersonville area and beyond. Um, the office is closed tomorrow, <laughs> uh, but we'll be back at it on Tuesday, and we'd love to see you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice unto God.
continue with Eucharistic prayer be on page 367 in the Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. from the Virgin Mary to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice that we may be acceptable through you, may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with blessed James and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, Save us. 
and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
I invite you to stand as we continue in the middle of page nine with our post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage of sin into true and lasting freedom in our Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you this day and be among us always. Amen. Amen.